I love the story of the long-winded preacher that got up to preach one Sunday and after he had preached for well over an hour, a man who was visiting that day with his wife, she was a member, he was not, the man got up to leave and the wife thought he's going to interrupt the service. She grabbed him by the coat sleeve and she said, where are you going? Preacher's not done. He said, I'm going to get a haircut. She said, why didn't you get a haircut before church started? He said, I didn't need a haircut before church started. Well, what we have in chapter 13 is in some ways a preacher who didn't quite know when to stop. We know, of course, that this chapter, like all of the Bible, is inspired by God and is absolutely perfect. But in as much as the book of Hebrews follows the flow and outline of a a Hebrew sermon, the preacher has already preached his message. He gave the invitation at the end of chapter 12. And at the end of chapter 13, he gives what your Bible may even label over in verses 20 to 25 as the benediction. But between the invitation and the closing prayer, it's almost as if he has a few more thoughts of how the congregation might apply the message that he's just finished preaching. Now, to understand that, we have to go back in our Bibles to the closing verses of chapter 12. And so I want you to look there with me before we begin today's message at chapter 12 and verse 28. There he tells us that since we have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken, since We're living under the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. Now he begins to tell us practically how do we live out that life of service, reverence, and awe. And he begins by giving this practical word about some public displays of affection. Now let's be honest, when we use that phrase, we're usually thinking about the young dating couple or maybe even the newlyweds who can't keep their eyes, their thoughts, or even their lips off of each other. I heard about an 18-year-old boy that was going over to his girlfriend's house to meet her parents for the very first time. They'd gone out on a few dates, but he never met her parents. So he decided he'd stop by the local flower shop and buy a couple of bouquets of flowers. The florist, who was a middle-aged man, asked him, Son, why are you taking two bouquets of flowers to your date? He said, well, the first one is to give to my girlfriend's mama. I've never met her before, and I want to butter that crazy woman up. The second bouquet of flowers is for my girlfriend because I want to schmooze her and maybe steal a kiss on the front porch while her dumb-as-dirt daddy isn't paying any attention. Well, he took those bouquets of flowers over to supper that night. The family gathered around the supper table, and the daddy called on the young man to pray. And oh my, did he pray. He prayed, and 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 he prayed. prayed. When he finally said amen, his girlfriend said, Honey, I didn't know you were so religious. He said, No, and I didn't know your daddy was the florist. (laughs) Well, the affection on display here is not the romantic love between a man and a woman. It's Christian love. And according to our text, that Christian love is to be expressed to the brother, the stranger, and the prisoner. John Phillips, the great commentator, says we're to express this love to the saints, to the stranger, and to the sufferer. But I want to use these ER words, the brother, the stranger, the prisoner. And show us how the Bible says within the body of Christ we're to publicly display our affection one for another. Let's start with verse 1. Communion with the brother. Do Do you still have your Bible open? Look at it. Let love of the brethren continue. One translation says keep on loving each other as brothers. The King James says... Let brotherly love continue. It's the word in the Greek of the New Testament. It's the word Philadelphia. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to know that Philadelphia means brotherly love. Our city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is the city of brotherly love. And the the Holy Spirit here says, let Philadelphia continue. Let love of the brothers and sisters in the body of Christ continue. Now, again, I want to point out the context of this commandment. It's the first example of how we live out a life of gratitude, reverence, and awe of God. When this chapter begins, he gives us this practical advice. Uh, Next week in verses 5 to 6, he says, We honor God by how we live financially. 
In verse 4 that we've already examined, he said we honor God by how we live, not financially, but sexually. Here he says we honor God by how we live financially, sexually, and relationally. We honor God and live under His supremacy by how we treat one another. Let brotherly love continue. Now it's obvious to today's preacher that that preacher was familiar with the Olivet Discourse of Jesus, a sermon preached on the Mount of Olives. There Jesus described the day of judgment and said in Matthew 25, 40, the king will answer and say to them, this is judgment day, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it for one of the least of these my brothers or my sisters, you did it for me. The way that we treat one another is the visible expression of what we think of and how we love the Lord Jesus Christ. Now once again, the context of the book of Hebrews is very important. First century believers were professing faith in Jesus. They were coming out of the religion of Judaism. But when they began to profess Christ as Lord, not Caesar as Lord under the Roman Empire, they began to face intense persecution. We'll see in a moment... They began to lose their homes. They began to lose their jobs. They lost their possessions. Many of them were excommunicated from the temple and therefore kicked out of the family and disowned by their own biological family. And in the midst of that intense persecution, many of them began to say, maybe this Jesus following thing is not what it's all cracked up to be. Maybe I'm going to renounce my faith in Jesus and turn back to the religion of Judaism. I had once decided to follow Jesus, but now now I'm thinking about turning back, turning back. And The Holy Ghost of God moves to write this letter to say, here's the remedy for people who are ready to throw in the towel with Jesus. The remedy, listen, is a group like this this morning. That when the world has chewed us up and spit us out, that we know if we can get among the body of Christ, there I'm going to be encouraged, strengthened, cared for, loved, protected. Let brotherly love Continue. Now, with that in mind, let me mention two things out of verse 1. The first I've labeled a spiritual connection. Let brotherly love continue. Now, it is certainly true that as Christians we're commanded to love everyone. But the word Philadelphia here means we're to have a special love for people in the body of Christ. In the same way that we should love everyone, but we have a special love for our biological family. We have a special love for our parents, our children, uh, 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 all throughout our physical family. I love everyone. I love you, you love me, but I love my wife and my four kids in a different but a deeper way. In the same way, we're to, why? Because they're my family. In the same way, we're to have love for every man, woman, boy, and girl, but a special love For those that are in the family of faith. And if that distinction bothers you, let me point out that I'm on good Bible territory. Because in Galatians 6.10, Paul said, while we have the opportunity, let's do good to all people. And especially to those. That is double your effort. Especially to do good to those who are of the household of faith. As believers and followers of Christ, we're to have more in common with Christians than with anybody else. Let me say that again. We're to have more in common with Christians that we don't have anything else in common with than with non-believers that we share everything else in common with. That is, I have more in common with a Jesus follower of a different ethnicity, of another nationality, who lives on the other side of the globe that I've never even met before. I've got more in common with them than I would have if I had a twin identical brother that did not know Christ as Lord and Savior. We're to have a special bond 
a divine union with others who've tasted of the grace of Jesus. There is a spiritual connection. Note, secondly, a steadfast continuation. Let brotherly love continue. And when I began studying this verse, I, I looked at that word continued. I wonder, what in the world does it mean? So I got down my Strong's Concordance. And if you don't know, that's a Bible study resource. It, it helps you understand the meaning of the Hebrew words of the Old Testament, the original Greek words of the New Testament. And I dug down into the meaning of that word continue. Let brotherly love continue. Church, would you be interested to know what it means? It means continue. It means don't stop. It means don't let anything interrupt it or impede it. It obviously implies, listen, that brotherly love should be the natural default setting of the body of Christ. That, that if we didn't do anything else, we ought to love one another. You've got to do something to mess it up. That it should be natural and automatic that you and I are in love with one another because we're all sinners saved by the same grace of the same Savior on the same cross. And that brotherly love is to continue. I think these things are tied together. The brotherly love will continue if we recognize we have a spiritual connection. It will help us overcome our differences if we recognize the one thing, the greater thing, the preeminent thing that we have in common. You see, the Jesus in me and the Jesus in you can commune together and walk in unity despite any other differences that we may have. I've known some people who have more in common with Christ-hating pagans who just happen to be fans of their favorite football team. I mean, we're, we wear the same jersey on Friday and Saturday and we'll overlook everything else and walk in fellowship with them. I've known business partners who who will stay in business together despite moral, ethical, even religious differences because the pursuit of financial gain is the thing that keeps them together, even though one's a Christian and one is not. And we have certainly seen young people and single adults get involved, a Christian get involved relationally, romantically, with someone that's not a Christian because their desire for that spark, for that 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 quivering of the liver, that spine-tingling romance, that, that's the thing that holds them together, not their love for Jesus. But now if we recognize that we are one in the bond of Christian love, we'll be able to let brotherly love continue. Let me give you a simple example. This past week, I was blessed to preach a revival in northeast Tennessee. Last Saturday evening when I got off the airplane, I was wearing my Georgia Bulldog ball cap. Go you big hairy dogs. That didn't go over real well in northeast Tennessee. They started singing Rocky Top, Rocky Top, Rocky Top. I thought I was going to have to call in sick on Sunday morning. One of the men who had seen that at the airport came to Sunday service and brought me Looked to me like a hunting cap. I mean, it was bright blaze orange, but it had a gray T right on the front of it, and he gave it to me. On Wednesday night, after a wonderful week of revival, the church gave me a big orange coffee mug that had a T on one side and go Vols on the other side. And even though I love my Georgia Bulldogs, let the church say amen. The rest of you are backsliders. I was able to open up that gift, hold up that orange coffee mug, and here's what I told them. I said, I'm going to put this mug in my office. I'm going to drink coffee from this mug. And every time I drink coffee from this mug, I'm going to think about you. I'm going to think about the wonderful week of revival we had together. And this mug will remind me that I hate the volunteers. <laughs> but I love you, and I'll pray for God to continue to work in your church. Now, I admit to you, I could not do that if it had been an Alabama Crimson Tide mug. <laughs> I mean, love has its limits. Somebody say amen. amen. But you see, all jokes aside, the one thing that we have in common, Jesus, is greater than Saturday afternoon rivalry. 
Hey, the love we have in Jesus is greater than the fact that the choir didn't sing my favorite song. The love we have in Jesus is greater than the fact that I didn't get a visit when I went to the hospital. We'll talk about our, our duty to that in just a moment. I'm not neglecting or minimizing that. But the love that I have for you in Jesus is greater than the offense that happened in the nursery or the preschool department or at the business meeting. The love that we share in Jesus is greater than differing opinions about this building or that program or that ministry because we've got a common bond. And the Word of God says don't let anything, I mean don't let anything at all hinder the continuation of that love. A public display of affection begins with communion for the brother. Number two, from verse two, there's compassion on the stranger. Our second verse, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it, or angels unaware. Now the first verse used the word Philadelphia. This second verb, uh, second verse uses a Big old word, philoxenia. Again, it's philo or love. But it's not love of the brother here. It's love of the xeno. In English, we'd spell it X-E-N-O. Perhaps you've heard the word xenophobe. Uh, These days, with our political discourse focusing on immigration issues and open borders and the need to secure our borders... Somebody these days who believes that a nation ought to have sovereignty over its own borders and not allow anybody and everybody to just come into the country illegally in violation of our immigration laws, such a person will be called a xenophobe. Uh, You have a phobia of the xena. Xena, in this case, references a foreigner, somebody who's not from around here. But this verse is not talking about having a phobia of the xena but having a philo of the xena. Not a fear of the foreigner, but a love of the foreigner. Not a fear of the stranger, but a love for the stranger. Not a hatred for the person that's not from around here, but a special love for the Christian who's not from around here. Now verse 2 Shows us two simple things. The first I will label a simple requirement. Do not neglect hospitality. The word neglect is negative. And so when you say do not neglect, there's sort of a double negative here that is used for emphasis. The writer says, don't you dare neglect to do what you ought to do for strangers. The stranger is the recipient, but the requirement is to the Christian to show hospitality. Now, hospitality is a requirement, for example, for pastors. You can read that in 1 Timothy 3, 2. A requirement for the pastor, the bishop, the overseer is that he must be hospitable. Hospitality is also a characteristic of a godly woman, according to 1 Timothy 5, 10. And by the way, God bless you ladies who, at least in our culture tend to have those God-given domestic skills to help show hospitality and compassion when people are in times of crisis. When there's a surgery or a need, it is disproportionately God-called women who head to the kitchen and cook up those special casseroles. Now, thank God for those men who head out to the grill and cook up some, some ribs. But usually it's the casseroles and the banana pudding that ladies gifted by God and called by the Master show hospitality. It's a requirement for a pastor. It's a characteristic of a godly woman. But here we see it's actually a requirement for all believers. Every Christian is to have a hospitable spirit. John MacArthur comments on verse 2 and says that hospitality should be a mark for all Christians, a basic characteristic, not an incidental or optional practice. Now when the Bible says we should show hospitality to strangers, I think we need to carefully define this word because I've heard some people 
say that this verse commands us to pick up hitchhikers. That it commands us to just let anyone and everyone stay in our home. Perhaps you heard about the man who picked up a hitchhiker. And uh, they got a couple of miles down the road. And the hitchhiker said to the driver, Aren't you even a little bit afraid that I might be a serial killer? And the driver said, No, based on my studies and statistics, there are only two active serial killers in this state. And it's not very likely that both of us are in the same car. (laughs) Hang on to that. You you, You may need to use that in case God lays on your heart to pick up a hitchhiker. My point here is very simple. This commandment from the Lord is not a requirement that we we don't use common sense. This verse is not a mandate to just throw caution to the wind and to live dangerously. This verse is not a mandate that we hand wads of cash out the window to every person standing on the corner with a sign that says they'll work for food. There's nothing that would prohibit you from doing that, although I think if someone says I will work for food, I'd rather go through the drive through and give them some food that they have to eat rather than money that could be used for other things. Uh, I think it was last summer we were down in St. Augustine on vacation and we went over to a shopping center area because that's why you go to the beach so you can take your wife to a shopping center. And we were pulling out and there was a man standing there, uh, you know, panhandler with one of those cardboard signs and it said, you know, Hungry will work for food. I actually took my cell phone out and took a picture of it because we were pulling out of a shopping center. Right across the road was a fast food restaurant. I think it was a Wendy's hamburger joint. And on their marquee, it said, Help wanted, apply inside. And here's a man saying, I will work for food. I thought, walk across the street. You don't have to say amen to that. I'll amen my own sermon. Amen, that's good preaching. Walk across the street and get a job. But the reality is in the American culture today, you can make more money as a panhandler than going to get an honest job. This verse does not say that you must feel compelled to hand money to someone in a situation like that. Though there's nothing wrong if you think that's what the Lord has called you to do. And certainly this verse does not mean we have to open our home to a rank stranger with no consideration of the potential danger. And might I say while I'm in this neck of the Bible, in our current woke evangelical movement in America, this verse is used to to argue for the elimination of borders. A a lot of well-intended, scripturally mistaken people quote this verse to say, That if anyone is from a foreign country, we have an obligation to give them free entrance into this country, free health care, free education, free food, free clothing, free shelter to anybody that wants to break our laws in this country illegally. And I just want to bluntly suggest to you that that is not what this verse is talking about. This verse is describing people who are escaping persecution in the days of the Roman Empire. They were on the run having been kicked out of their homes, dispossessed of all their possessions, exiled for their faith in Jesus Christ. And this verse would tell us that if a Christian is being persecuted anywhere, it should touch the heart of other Christians everywhere. And should they flee that persecution there and come here, they should know they've got family here that will care for them here because they've had to leave there. Now, it's not very likely that you will encounter a foreigner, someone who's not an American citizen this week. You probably are not likely to encounter one like that who fled that country because of religious persecution. It's possible, but not very likely. Yet, there's some practical application. I think there's a principle here that we can still apply to other issues in our lives as Christians. Namely, that when we encounter another believer who is in an uncomfortable, new, unsettling situation or environment, our heart should go out to them to love them and care for them and let them know that they are welcome. It may be a new family in town. They've just simply moved here with a job change or a life change. Maybe a new family that's bought a home in your neighborhood. Maybe it's a new renter in the trailer park where you live. There's somebody that's, they don't know anybody. And you've lived long enough to know that if somebody's new in town and they get befriended by the wrong crowd, 
Their life's going in one direction. They get befriended by the right crowd and God will use that to move their life in the right direction. I know school's almost out for this year, but could I talk to the students for just a moment? When that new kid is in your class, maybe they've just moved here and they're new to the community or new to your school. Those of you in the fifth grade now, when you go to middle school next year and you've got classmates from three different elementary schools just in our own county, you've got some students there, they feel unsettled. They feel uncomfortable. I believe this verse would mandate that Christian young people prioritize ministry to the outcast. That we focus on loving on the one that doesn't seem to fit in. That somebody that nobody else wants to be around, they ought to feel safe. Boy, our culture talks a lot about finding a safe space. This is one area in which I think that's good. That when they see a professed Christ follower, they ought to be able to say, I'm going to sit at that table with them. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang out with that group. I'm going to run with that bunch because I know that's a group that will love me. Again, the overall context of this book and of this passage is people who were fleeing persecution, losing everything that they've owned. They're in a new place, and they feel totally unsettled and uncertain. And do you know the Bible's remedy for that? Is you and me. That we let brotherly love continue and do not neglect the showing of hospitality to the stranger. There's a simple requirement. Note also in verse 2, a shocking reminder This is just a practical reason why we should show kindness and hospitality to the stranger. Verse 2 says, For by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Oh my. An angel. This is not the stuff of a Stephen King novel. This is the inspired word of God. It says the way that we treat strangers... You may have actually encountered an angel. I don't know how many of you remember the actor Michael Landon. Uh, Michael Landon was Little Joe Cartwright in Bonanza. He was Charles Ingalls on Little House on the Prairie. But the last TV series that he wrote and produced, starred in, was called Highway to Heaven. He and Victor French, who had been Mr. Edwards on Little House on the Prairie, starred in this movie. And Michael Landon's character was supposedly an angel. He had come back to earth to earn his wings. Or maybe you remember the TV series Touched by an Angel. Well, for all of the false doctrine about angels and the afterlife that those movie series, TV series perpetuated. And by the way, there was a plenty of false doctrine. But for all of the false doctrine that you found in those TV shows, they got at least one thing right. That stranger from another town, maybe a stranger from another time, And that traveler from another land may actually be a traveler from another world. You say, I don't know if I believe that. Well, Father Abraham would disagree. Because in his day, the Bible says that he entertained three guys he thought were men, but they were actually angels, and one of them was the angel of the Lord. A pre-incarnate visit of Jesus Christ. And the way that he treated them was literally the way he was treating Jesus. The mom and dad of Samson, the strong man of Israel, Manoah and his wife did the same thing. Entertained a man they thought was a stranger. He was in fact the angel of God, a pre-incarnate visit of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to be very careful how we treat people that we don't know who they are or where they're from because here's the reality. You don't, you don't know who they are <laughs> or where they may be from. 
You say, preacher, I've never entertained an angel in the form of a stranger. You don't know that. Here the Bible says we're to have public displays of Christian affection. Communion with the brother. Compassion on the stranger. Thirdly and finally, consideration of the prisoner. I'm now in verse 3. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them. In other words, act like you're a prisoner yourself. And remember those who are ill-treated since you yourselves also are in the body. Herman Melville was the author of the classic novel Moby Dick. But Herman Melville also wrote another novel called The White Jacket. It was also set on the open seas. There was, a, there was this ship out in the middle of the ocean and there was a surgeon on that ship. His name was Dr. Cuticle. I don't know why his name was Cuticle, but that was his name. And in the novel, Dr. Cuticle was a bit upset because nobody on the ship would get sick. And he wasn't able to do his job. So he was actually uh, quite happy when one of the sailors came to him with severe abdominal pain. And uh, Dr. Cuticle quickly and happily diagnosed that it was appendicitis. We're going to have to do an emergency appendectomy. He laid the guy out on the table. Called a bunch of sailors into the surgical room because he wanted to impress them with how gifted he was as a skilled surgeon. So he carefully with a scalpel opened the patient up. And he's talking to these men the whole time. Bragging on his skill as a surgeon. He's labeling everything that he's done. I mean it's like a surgical Uh, a seminar right there and finally when he takes the appendix out sews them all up and he's tying up that last stitch proud of himself he looks up to those sailors standing around the surgical table and he sees them with white ghost white faces they are full of fear it's then he realizes they're staring at the patient who died about an hour earlier It's one of the recurring themes in Melville's writings. Somebody who's so busy going about what they're doing, they don't even notice the greater need of someone right in front of them. That's really what I thought of when I read this third verse. The tragic example of living a life so busy doing my thing, your thing, our thing, that we don't even notice the plight of others Around us. And the writer here says we need to have consideration in this case of the prisoner. Two simple things as we close. Note with me, first of all, the cause of their bondage. Why exactly have they been incarcerated? Well, several weeks ago, here in our own church fellowship hall, our local sheriff, Ramsey Bennett, hosted a meeting with law enforcement and members of the faith community. Pastors and other church leaders filled our fellowship hall with members from our local law enforcement. And his primary purpose was to talk to leaders in the faith community about the the rising tide of fentanyl addiction. And the havoc that it's wreaking across our own community. And part of that was an appeal that we have compassion as Christian churches and as Christian believers Because when people find themselves addicted to things like drugs and alcohol, oftentimes they want to be free from it as much or more than you want them to be free of it. But it set a hook in their soul. And he was making an appeal for churches like ours to be more involved in prison ministry. And so this is an opportunity for me to share that with you. And to say, with no pun intended, if you want to go teach the Bible, do a Sunday school class at the prison, you're invited to do so, and you'll literally have a captive audience. You'll catch that on the way home. While prison ministry is a wonderful thing, generally speaking, the writer here has something a little more specific in mind. And so as I drill down into what he has specifically in mind, I just want to point out the specific emphasis here does not negate the general call to care for those who are in prison. But why are these people in this text in prison? I mean, people get arrested every day. We read their names, we see their pictures in the paper. Why are these folks in prison? They are in prison for the sake 
of the gospel. Namely, in that day of the Roman Empire, professing Christ as Lord was a criminal offense. Their possessions and property would be taken away from them and they would be thrown in jail. And by the way, that still happens today all around the world. The writer has already introduced us to this fact back in chapter 10, beginning in verse 32. You can turn there or you can watch it on the screen. He says, remember the former days when after being enlightened, think back to what happened, he says, right after you were saved. You endured a great conflict of suffering, partly by being made a public spectacle. This is what happened when you got saved in the Roman Empire. You were a public spectacle through insults and distress, partly by becoming companions with those who were so treated. Look right here and listen to me. He says, here's what happened after you got saved. You began to experience persecution not only because of your faith in Christ, but because you became a partner, a companion with other people who were being persecuted for their faith in Christ. You said, in essence, if you're going to arrest them for following Jesus, you better bring two arrest warrants because I'm with them, they're with me. We're both with Jesus. We're in this thing together. Like the old t-shirt said, mess with me, mess with the whole trailer park. You began to experience persecution Because you were united with people who are also facing persecution. Look at the next verse, verse 34. And you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. Why? Knowing you've got for yourself a better and lasting possession. So you hear about somebody in your Sunday school class that got arrested for professing Jesus. You go down and you turn yourself in. And you say, if you're going to arrest them, you're going to have to arrest me. Why would anybody gladly hand over the title deed to their property as a Christ follower? He says, because you know you've got something better than a a piece of temporary sod here on the earth. You've got a better and a lasting possession in heaven. Here they have been incarcerated because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that we should treat them the way we would want to be treated if we ourselves were in prison. Here again, I'm drawn to Matthew 25, 40, where on the day of judgment, King Jesus will answer and say to them, you clothed the naked, you fed the hungry, you cared for the poor, you visited the sick, and to the extent that you did it for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. Once again, God's remedy for this problem is is us. Could I just make a practical application point in the culture we live in today? You say we live in America, we don't face persecution for our faith. Hey, if you work for the government, that includes public education. If you work for a national corporation, you are already facing pressure that there are some things you cannot say There's some things you cannot post, even on your personal Facebook page. Or you will be called in, not before a magistrate, you'll be called in before the HR department and said, if you want to keep your job here, you take that Bible belief off of your Facebook page. And I just want to ask you this morning, what would happen? I was watching the news this past week where a public school teacher out in the state of California was fired because she would not refer to a boy in her class as a girl. What would happen if all the Christians in that state said, you fire her, you're going to have to fire me too. Because I've got more in common with that person standing for right and standing for Bible truth than I do with my paycheck or the Department of Education for the state of California or for the state of Georgia for that matter. If you are taking them down for their faith, count me in that number. I'm standing with them. And whatever judgment they've got to face, pour it out on me too. The remedy for someone being fearful of standing on their own is that we all stand together the cause of their bondage. That leads to a final point I've labeled the commonality of the body. Look at the end of verse 3. Why, why should we treat one another this way even 
if some are ill-treated or in prison, since you yourselves also are in the body. Here's the reason. You're in the body as well. Now here, in the body could reference being in the body of Christ. That, that you're my brother, you're my sister, we're in the body of Christ together. But, but most likely it references the fact that they're being afflicted in their physical body. You ought to have compassion on them as well because you've got a physical body too. You, will, you should know what it's like to be deprived of food, deprived of clothing, deprived of shelter, deprived of income. So just simply think, what would I want somebody to do for me if I were in the same situation they were in? You're in the body. Years ago, it was Pastor Johnny Hunt who taught me a valuable lesson in a small group of pastors. I'm sure there are many days I have forgotten this lesson and regularly need to relearn it. But he commented on how in the body of Christ, when we know of somebody walking through a difficulty, we will often say, hey, if you need anything, call me. You got something you need? I'm one phone call away, one, one text away. Hey, you need something? Let me know. I'm here for you. Pastor Johnny rightly said there's nothing wrong with saying that. Nothing wrong with that at all. So if you've said that, don't feel bad about it. But he said we need to take it a step further. Because if you'll just stop and think about it, there'll be some things you already know they're going to need. And you shouldn't have to wait on them to call you or ask for it. For example, you're a mother with two or three young children, preschool age or younger, and you hear about a lady maybe in your mom's group or in your Sunday school class that's going to have foot surgery, she's got to be off her feet for a month, not able to stand, not able to walk. Can you not say, look, her life is my life. I I may not know everything she may need, but I know she probably needs some help doing the laundry, probably needs some help with some meals, May be good if I call and say, what day, not can I, but what day this week could I come over and get the kids and keep them for the whole afternoon? The idea is you're in the body too. You know full well the things that would be needed. Don't wait on them to ask, just step in and do it. In that sense, the writer simply says, you've got a body with needs just like them. Don't forget one another's needs. Don't forget a public display of affection. Songwriter Bill Gaither put it like this. He said, you'll notice that we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family and these folks are so dear. When one has a heartache, we all shed a tear and we rejoice in each victory in this family so near. He said, so I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Washed in the fountain and cleansed by his blood. I'm a joint heir with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God.